Americans famously love happiness so much, they even put the pursuit of it right in their Declaration of Independence. But for American writer Susan Cain, whose last book completely changed how the world saw introverts, happy is not quite all it's cracked up to be. In fact, as her new book points out, other less celebrated emotional states are essential to a good life. The new book is called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. And Susan Cain joins us now from New York, New York. And it's great to have you on our program, Susan. How are you doing tonight? I am doing great. It's so good to be here, Steve. Thanks for having me. We are delighted to have you. We're going to start by just reading an excerpt of your book, and then we'll dive in after that uh, as we try to answer the question, what is bittersweet? Here we go. A tendency to states of longing, poignancy, and sorrow, an acute awareness of passing time, and a curiously piercing joy at the beauty of the world. The bittersweet is also about the recognition that light and dark, birth and death, bitter and sweet are forever paired. Days of honey, days of onion, as an Arabic proverb puts it. The tragedy of life is linked inescapably with its splendor. You could tear civilization down and rebuild it from scratch and the same dualities would rise again. Yet to fully inhabit these dualities, the dark as well as the light, is paradoxically the only way to transcend them. And transcending them is the ultimate point. The bittersweet is about the desire for communion, the wish to go home. That's beautifully written, if I may say so, just uh, off the top here. This does Thank feel, you. though, this does feel like a sadder time than most. Two years mm -hmm. of COVID-19, an awful war in Ukraine that is just disgusting. What, as you look at it, what's the difference between feeling melancholy, as you describe it here, and just out and out depression? They are different, and in our current culture and also in mainstream psychology, we lack a way to distinguish between the two of them. Um, clinical depression, as we know, is a kind of emotional black hole that saps you of the ability really to, to live, to love yourself, to, to move forward. Melancholy can be a tremendously productive state in which you feel a sense of great connection to other people, to other beings. It can also be a real wellspring of creativity. Um, there, you know, Aristotle 2000 years ago asked this question of why it is, as in his observation, that the great poets of the time, politicians, philosophers, why so many of them had melancholic personalities. And that is a question that has been asked throughout the ages, really all the way up until the current age, where in our blinding quest for a monochrome happiness, we have lost sight of the full dimension of what it's like to be human. Well, that's it. We, we spend a great deal of our life trying to avoid this melancholy that you say we need so desperately. Do you find that bizarre? Do I find it bizarre that we try to ignore it? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, you know, and there's many reasons for this. I, I, I trace them in the book, but kind of the, the, the short version, I guess, is that as we became in the 19th century, um, a culture that was so focused on business success, and, and in the 19th century, we kind of went through a series of booms and busts and booms and busts, and, and people would lose all their money or fail to earn it in the first place. And, and this question started to come up of like, what, what was it that would make one person succeed and another person fail? And whereas in the past, we had answered that question by assuming that it was just the, the vagaries of misfortune, you know, just bad luck, um, or outside forces that were acting upon a person. Increasingly, the answer became that there was something inside the person that had caused their success or failure. And the more you start to believe that, the more you think that, um, the more you want to avoid at all costs the attributes of somebody who looks like a quote loser you know and, and the word loser kind of kept uh, increasing in its use it still is to this day um so the more you want to avoid looking like a loser the less you're going to talk about questions of loss which are fundamental to the human experience um the less you're going to ever talk about sorrows longings that dimension um, you know, you'll you'll listen to music and and hear it that way, or see it in a piece of art, but you don't ever want to talk about it, and and that's that's a shame because we're we're all living sort of emotionally circumscribed existences as a result. Sure. Do do you do you see a particular personality type or types that are prone to melancholy or yearning? 
Well, uh, we do have in the quiz a, a bittersweet quiz. I'm sorry, we have in the book a bittersweet quiz that uh, I developed with two great psychologists, Scott Barry Kaufman and David Yadin. And, um, and, so, and, and the quiz measures how prone people are to these kinds of bittersweet experiences where you're aware of happiness and sadness all at once. And we, f- we did find that people who are prone to these states also tend to be prone to experiences of awe, self-transcendence, and spirituality, um, and also to score high on a, on a, um, a psychological trait known as high sensitivity, which is a kind of a person who reacts intensely to both the positives and negatives of life. You know, somebody who reacts to the gorgeousness of a sunset and also to the, 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 the screeching sound of a construction site outside their window. Well, I, I did the quiz. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if it's possible to fail the quiz. I feel like I failed the quiz because, you know, like one of your questions, for example, is do you find comfort or inspiration in a rainy day? And I'm sorry, that's a zero for me. But on mm-hmm. the other hand, you know, have people ever described you as an old soul? And that's a 10 for me. So mm-hmm. I end up, you know, sort of a mediocre 5.4 at the end of the day, which is, I, I, I don't know. As you look at it, do you think more people... Do you lead a better life the higher number you score on the quiz? Because that's essentially what you're trying to get us to embrace, right? Our inner melancholy. Um, I am, but I don't believe, I I believe there's many different pathways to a better life. And um, the quiz and the book is shining a light on one incredibly powerful pathway that has been undervalued in our culture. It's not to say that it's the only one. It's to say that it's an incredibly powerful one. Um, and, uh, if it makes you feel better, <laughs> I, was, I was doing, a, an event the other day with my dear friend, Angela Duckworth, um, you know, the author of the book Grit and, and Angela is a very kind of a beat, cheerfully optimistic person. Like, she's hilarious. If you ever meet her. Um, and anyway, she said she did the, she took the quiz and scored a zero. <laughs> so you're in good company. <laughs> Well, I did better than zero, but (laughs) zero is a little harsh. There was the, I mean, the last question you ask is, well, actually, I want to put it to you here because I'm not sure I completely understood it. And presumably it means different things to different people, which was, do you feel the ecstatic is close at hand? What do you interpret that to mean? Well, all human beings, one of the most fundamental aspects of being human is to come into this world with a sense of longing for a more perfect and beautiful world to which we feel we belong, you know, and there's a kind of gap between the world that we live in, the the very imperfect, beautiful, beautifully imperfect one, let's say, that we live in and, and that world that we dream of. And we know that this is fundamental because it has been expressed in every religion, you know, whether you're looking at the Garden of Eden or Mecca or Zion, you know, the yearning for these states, for these places. Um, and we have secular expressions of it also. Uh, somewhere of, over the rainbow in the Wizard of Oz mm. is essentially the same human longing as that for the Garden of Eden. It's the same thing. There is a kind of a brush with the ecstatic that comes from being tuned uh, being, being dialed into that state of longing. And we know this too from the mystical traditions of the great religions. Um, if you look at Suf- Sufism, for example, which is the mystical uh, branch of Islam, uh, there's a long tradition there of understanding that the longing is what brings you to the sense of the divine, it's to the sense of belonging. And this is equally true for people who consider themselves atheists. You know, we, we have a kind of false dichotomy, I would say, in our culture between the secular uh, and the religious. And for those firmly on the secular side, that is causing us to lose sight of one of the great states of being alive. Well, you've just described the ecstatic in very deep and profound ways, but you are also, I'm going to bring this right down to brass tacks. You're also a Los sure. Angeles Rams football fan, and they won the <laughs> Super Bowl last year. So I wonder whether that got you a little closer to ecstatic than you had anticipated. <laughs> well, I will say if you had seen the the scene in my in, in, in my family living room, because my, my husband and my boy, we're, we're all huge Rams fans, um, that definitely looked like a lot of ecstasy all in one place. 
I, I mean, I, I, I totally feel that because, you know, for example, the Toronto Maple Leafs haven't won the Stanley Cup in 55 years, and they got a good team this year. Uh, I can guarantee you there are going to be two and a half million people in Toronto who are real close to ecstasy if and when that ever were to happen, God willing, in our lifetime at some point. But is that the... Now, that's, that's obviously... That's not the kind of profound, you know, in touch with God kind of ecstasy you're referring to in the book, but does it still count? It does still count. And I actually talk about this with my husband all the time because I'm, I'm much less of a sports person, but my husband and my, my two sons are like to the extreme. Um, and, and it was really my husband who first was pointing this, this out to me that the way that uh, sports fans feel, especially with team sports where it's a communal experience, you know, that, that there is this sense when the team wins where like you, you're all in a moment of collective transcendence where, you know, you, you've all transcended yourself and you've joined together into some kind of communion. Um, it, it, it's really very similar also to what people feel when they go to a musical concert that really moves them. Um, and, you know, you have that moment of, of just collective joy and collective union. Exactly. So, so yeah, we, we, we do have these brushes with that experience. You could say in our everyday lives, or you could say in these um, actually in moments where we step outside our everyday lives uh, to go to the sports arena or the concert hall or whatever it is. Well, we should talk about a great Canadian that you write about in your book. Do you know who I'm talking about here? Of course I do. I thought you I... might. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Leonard Cohen's your guy. How come? Oh, gosh. I, I Yes, I have loved him for decades. I actually dedicated uh, the book in his memory and, uh, and one of his quotations from his song Anthem is the epigraph to the book. And, um, you know, I, I for the, all those decades, I had loved him without exactly understanding why. But as I started researching the book and, and his life, I realized that he is the embodiment of a life philosophy that I hold very dear and I'm trying to express in the book. Um, it, it comes out especially in the epigraph that I used, which is um, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. Mm. And, um, and, and I learned that he derived much of that philosophy from the Kabbalah, which is the mystical version of Judaism. And like one of the central metaphors in the Kabbalah is the idea that all of creation was at first an intact vessel, a divine vessel which then shattered, and that the world we're living in now is a beautiful world, but also a broken world with these shards from that vessel scattered all around us. And that the, the way to live amidst that brokenness is to try to you know, pick up those beautiful shards of light wherever you can find them. And again, I, I believe this kind of metaphor is incredibly, um, it's an incredible lodestone, even for someone who considers themselves a complete atheist. That's not the, 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 there, there's a powerful truth in that mm -hmm. um, that can help us, especially in moments like this where, you know, as, as you said, when we started, we're living through the pandemic and the war in Ukraine and all of it. Um, but to remember that there are these cracks where the light gets in uh, is very, uh, very useful. Indeed. And uh, I want to pick up on that if I can here because and we'll stay with music here. I think many people will well remember, and we're going back, I guess, about 30 years now in Sarajevo, where there was a cellist who sort of, mm -hmm. amidst all of the bombing, was just playing this gorgeous music. Uh, and we see the same thing now in Ukraine, uh, where there was a pianist named Karina Manukina playing Chopin in the ruins of her house near Kiev, and uh, the house having been damaged by Russian shelling. We've got a clip of that. I just want to play some of that, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would, mm -hmm. the clip. I mean, you want to talk profoundly magnificent. There it is right there. What impulse do you think is being exercised there to play music, to play beautiful music amidst complete chaos and ruin? It is the instinct to want to transcend um, the chaos, the sorrow, the brokenness that 
I mean, it was literally all around her in that beautiful clip. I mean, literally everything is broken around her. Um, but there's a sense in which that kind of music and the what what art really can be at its best, and this is true not only for great art, but also for, you know, like a kindergarten kid scribbling a picture um, or for the cake that, <laughs> that, you, that you baked last night. What, what art can really be at its best is the human impulse to transform pain into beauty. And this is why we love sad songs the way that we do, because there's something in them where you're sensing the musician's willful desire to say, I'm faced with pain and I can do two different things with it. You know, I can descend into it and I can take it out on myself or the people around me, or I can try to turn it into something um, that is the best of human experience and into an expression of love. And that's what, that's what she was doing in that gorgeous clip. Well, you've got the numbers in your book. You say people tend to play on their playlists, on their smartphones, uh, 170 times the happy songs and 800 times the sad songs. I mean, that's not even close. What does that say about us? Right. Yeah. For people who where their favorite song is sad music, they will play it 800 times. <laughs> what it says is there's something about that kind of music that explains us to ourselves and explains ourselves to each other. Um, what people who listen to that kind of music also tell researchers that when they hear it, they feel connected to awe and to wonder um, and to a sense of something greater than themselves. So it's what researchers call the sublime emotions. So that encapsulates almost better than anything else why it is such an, impo an emotional impoverishment to live in a culture that tells you not to go there, because these are some of the highest states of being human. Um, and we have all these different mechanisms that we've developed over the centuries to get us there, to get us to that state. And we should be using it more often. It's one of the great ways we have to connect. Well, I'm sorry to raise this now, but you do talk about it in the book, and this is hardly an academic discussion for you because you experienced, mm -hmm. you have experienced uh, over the last little while, uh, deep and significant loss in your life, the loss of a sibling, mm -hmm. the loss of a parent. And I, I wonder how hard it was for you, given the book that you have written, to keep in your mind the notion that the sorrow that you were definitely experiencing related to those deaths could somehow be constructive at the end of the day. How tough was that for you? Um, yeah, I lost my father and my brother to COVID. So that was happening kind of during the second half of writing the book. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a way in which having been immersed in this topic probably made it a little bit easier to bear because I was so attuned to the fact of the impermanence of life and the fact that everybody goes through these kinds of losses and bereavements. But I also want to say that, you know, especially for anybody who's listening, who is going through mourning themselves like that, I, 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 I wouldn't want the takeaway to be, you know, whatever grief you're feeling, the sorrow you're feeling, like immediately turn it into something constructive that, like, that, that would be an almost cruelly positive message, really. Um, in some ways, the message is more just to understand that you're not alone in it. And quite the contrary, this has always been the human experience. And, and I actually found that to be incredibly um, comforting, that in and of itself. You know, you're like, you're part of a greater communion and the sorrow you feel is the sorrow, not to take that away. Um, but, to, but to kind of draw on the fact of this is what life is as opposed to this is a terrible detour from what life is supposed to be. Hmm. Um, it, it, you, you stop resisting it so much, I think, when you accept it in those terms. It, it's uh, sure, yes. However, I mean, COVID-19, uh, that's just nothing that anybody, I'm sure two, more than two years ago, you did not anticipate experiencing that much loss because of the global pandemic in such a short space of time. And I wonder if you have to actually say to yourself while you're mourning, this sorrow that I am experiencing right now, uh, I know what it is and I understand it, I hate it, 
but I get it, and it will lead me ultimately to a better place. I don't know. Do you, do you, do you make those, do you have those conversations with yourself? So there's a, a poem that I talk about in the book. It was written 200 years ago by one of Japan's great poets. He wrote it after losing his daughter to smallpox. And I do believe losing a child is probably one of the greatest losses humans can ever face. And this poet, he was a Buddhist, so he was extremely deeply aware and schooled in the impermanence of life. And the poem that he wrote was basically a protest against that. You know, he, in, in the gentlest way, he wrote, I understand that a dewdrop is just a dewdrop, you know, meaning I understand that life is impermanent. Hmm. But even so, but even so. And, and I think that that's what we all feel at the end of the day. Like, yes, I get it. I, I get it that life is impermanent. I get it that I'm connected to everybody in this. But even so, I want my daughter back, right? Right. Um, and and accepting that that too is that's that's what grief is. Hmm. A bit of an odd question here for <clears throat> for an author, but uh, let's try this anyway. Given what you experienced while you were writing the book, did you feel the book came more easily? The the actual writing of it sort of came out of your fingertips more easily because of what you were actually experiencing while writing it? Um, honestly, no. I have been deeply aware of all of these currents of the human experience for my whole life. Um, you know, I've always thought of myself as a kind of happy melancholic. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we started by talking about that distinction between depression and melancholy. So. I've been lucky not to face depression, but I do have a kind of melancholic temperament. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that um, the book came just as easily the whole way through. You know, it was a real labor of love for me because it was it was something I really wanted to express and I knew that other people wanted to hear. Um, and in fact, it actually has been an interesting thing in that I never thought of this book as being a companion in any way to quiet my first book. Like they're quite different in a lot of ways, but the thing they both have in common is that the reactions I'm getting to bittersweet are identical to quiet and that people are saying, Oh, you know, finally I have a sense of permission to be who I am and feel the way I do and experience that, which I experience, um, you know, a, a sense of validation and a sense of permission. So I think that that was coming from a deep place was with me from the moment I first started. I totally get that because you do talk about a quote, tyranny of positivity that so many people uh, experience nowadays. How do we get out of that? Well, unfortunately, I think we're being yanked out of it by external events. Um, it becomes almost obscene to be uh, willful, to be like forcefully positive, let's say, um, in the face of actual problems, sorrows surrounding us. Um, but in terms of like concrete things that people can do in their everyday lives, there's a lot of them. Um, one would be like in the workplace, for example, to simply normalize these kinds of discussions. You know, I, I, I give a lot of virtual talks and, and at the beginning of the talks, very often the organizer will open by asking everybody to say how they feel in the chat box. And the chat box instantly fills up with like a whole <clears throat> collection of positive emotions. <clears throat> Excuse me, like everybody's feeling wonderful and great and thrilled <laughs> to be here. And, and I'm sure some people really are and that's wonderful, but I'm sure some people aren't and they don't feel like they can say so. So for leaders to go first um, and let people know what they're truly feeling and that they're still getting things done and those two things can coexist goes a long way. Um, there's also a practice called expressive writing that was discovered by a great psychologist named James Bene James Pennebaker at University of Texas. And he found that the simple act of writing down troubles or like the things that are bothering you, it could just be a couple of minutes at the beginning of the day where you scribble it down and throw it away after that. That simple act lowers people's blood pressure, makes them more successful at work, um, gives them a greater sense of well-being. He had one study where he took a 
group of engineers who had been laid off. They were in their 50s and they were pretty depressed about this and couldn't find work. And he asked half of them to write down what they were wearing every morning and the other half to write down how they were feeling and their troubles. And that, that second half who had written down what they truly felt were significantly more likely to have found work a few months later and their health markers improved too. It, it, it's kind of astonishing. Um, but the simple act of, of telling the truth about what, it, what you feel and what it is to be alive is incredibly liberating. Well, that is one thing this book does, is that it does give you permission to, to, to embrace your inner melancholy. But for those people, and uh, okay, confession time here, I think I'm one of them. For those people who are yeah. glass half full people, yeah. um, what, is there a message that they can take out of this book that you think uh, resonates just as much? Yes, I mean, it, even if you're a glass half full person, and I'm married to a glass half full person, so I know. It's annoying, isn't it? I know it? your way of being. No, I love it. <laughs> I, I actually think we complement each other really well. Um, so, but even into your life will come various troubles because that's the nature of being alive. So to kind of accept it and go with it, um, and also find the connection in it and realizing that. It, it, the same thing is true for every other human. Um, and this is one of the ways that we bond with each other. We actually knew this from uh, uh, evolutionary, evolutionary studies. So uh, it, 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 it can be a very helpful way of understanding how to deal with loss, which for somebody like you might actually in some ways come as more of a shock and a surprise because you're not as likely to be oriented that way or thinking about it in the first place. Yep. And it, it, it could catch you blindside when it comes. Fair point. Uh, last question for you. What's your favorite sad song? Oh, <laughs> like Leonard Cohen's whole library, let's say. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can go with Anthem, uh, you know, the, the song with which I dedicated the book. But there are so many of them. Super. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and uh, I'm so glad you wrote it. And it was a great read. Susan Cain, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. So nice of you to join us on TVO tonight, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.